Welcome back. Today I want to talk to you about medievalisms. Now, this lecture is being recorded for a couple of reasons. First of all, we're living through a global pandemic and this just seemed more efficient than face masks and moderating our social distance. Also, this video is a resource for you to revisit and refresh your memory. Uh, it will provide some essential context and resources that will ensure your success over the course of the semester. So let's begin with a quick review of some of the stuff we talked about last time. First of all, the Middle Ages is a period in European history from the decline of the Roman Empire, so 476, to the Renaissance, roughly 13th through the 15th century, depending on which region of Europe we're talking about. In England, this is the later 15th century. Um, this orientation, this situatedness of the Middle Ages, middle, is imposed by Italian humanists who understood themselves as uh, reviving classical learning and cultures. So Renaissance means rebirth, right? They felt that a thousand years of ignorance separated them from the ancient Greek and Roman cultures that they revered. Uh, Petrarch, for example, referred to his era, the 1300s, as a dark age, only in comparison to the heights of these uh, Greco-Roman cultures. Um, I urge you, please, do not refer to the Middle Ages as the Dark Ages. It's a surefire way to piss off medievalists, because uh, it basically assumes that humans were just living in the muck until finally Shakespeare came along and saved us all. Uh, and also, we want to avoid equating darkness with negative connotations. And this is going to be part of that anti-racist work that we're going to do over the course of the semester, paying attention to how we use rhetoric. Um, now, the Middle Ages encompass over a thousand years of history, change, innovations. So how do we make broad generalizations about diverse cultures? Uh, and influences for over a thousand years. Remember, periodization is a cultural construct. There is no hard and fast boundary that separates the Middle Ages from modernity. We impose these temporal boundaries, right? Classical, medieval, early modern, so that we can talk about these historical contexts. In fact, Glenn Berger observes that the pre of pre-modern or the middle of medieval is so often employed to indicate a stabilizing sequentiality. But medievalism can function as a coming and going rather than a start or finish to some organized narrative of origins. So medievalism encourages this move back and forth. And in fact, that's what we're going to be doing this semester. We're going to read medieval texts and then later medievalisms, right? So what is the difference between a medieval text and a medievalism? Well, a medieval text was written, composed, constructed during the Middle Ages. For example, you'll recall last time we talked about the Old English poem Beowulf, right? We also have Middle English literature, Chaucer. And in fact, we can also look at things such as Manuscripts. Now, this is a facsimile of a manuscript that's a little later than Chaucer. We can compare different texts, variations, uh, and look at what is original or authentic. And we'll talk more about authenticity in just a little bit. A medievalism, on the other hand, is a modern interaction with medieval texts and cultures. Uh, compare, for example, Beowulf, the Old English poem, to a modern translation of Beowulf, or a graphic novel retelling Beowulf, as well as other adaptations of this Old English poem. Let's look at some definitions and the ways that others have interacted with medievalisms. So Tyson Pugh and Angela Weissel explain that in its simplest sense, Medievalism refers to the art, literature, scholarship, avocational pastimes, and sundry forms of entertainment and culture that turn to the Middle Ages for their subject matter or inspiration, and in doing so, explicitly or implicitly, by comparison or by contrast, comment on the artist's contemporary sociocultural milieu. Let's clarify this with some examples. 
Now, you're probably familiar with some from popular entertainment, such as Game of Thrones, which is actually set in the Middle Ages, um, and Harry Potter, which is not set in the Middle Ages, but it is set in a castle, and it features some fantastic creatures, such as dragons. So there are references to medieval cultures within this text, even though it's not in the same time period. Um, this uh, medievalisms also include pastimes, such as Dungeons and Dragons, right? A game that some people have played, maybe you yourselves have played. Um, if you've heard of LARPing or live action role play, where you actually dress up and complete a medieval quest, as well as attractions like the Renaissance Festival. Medievalisms also inform our social customs, so a high school or college graduation when you wear a cap and gown, that costume is a medievalism. In fact, uh, universities are medieval institutions. So we can look at things like the Wabash College seal, right? Scientiae et virtuti, a Latin motto meaning for knowledge and virtue, connects our college to this medieval tradition of higher learning. Latin was the language of learning and literature. It was used in churches, governments, and schools. In a diverse classroom, Latin was the language that crossed cultural boundaries when you had students coming from France and Italy all over the place to study in one location, right? So to be literate in the Western Middle Ages meant to have some familiarity with Latin. And our school seal is implicitly siphoning authority from these medieval roots. We can look more specifically at a Wabash cartoonist, Dave Girard, a Wabash College graduate in 1931 and a member of the Sugar Creek Art School of Crawfordsville, drew this medievalism for Phi Delta Theta. And you can find similar works in our special collections at Lilly Library. These examples are clear indications of the medieval past um, incited in the present to construct a sense of tradition and authority. But among medievalisms, the connection between the Middle Ages and the present text is not always so explicit. To exemplify this, let's take a look at the movie Babe. Uh, Babe is a movie from the 90s, so we're talking about my childhood, not yours. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with this movie, I will provide a link where you can view a preview here. According to L.O. Aranye Freidenberg, Babe is, first of all, a film with a recognizably medievalist agenda. It celebrates love between master and servant. These days, animals have to stand in for the peasants, and rural life as the scene in which such love might be rediscovered. These figures recall the master tropes of anti-utilitarian medievalism in the 19th century. So does the film's insistent association of meaningless speech with commercialism and disbelief in the remarkable and its association of meaningful speech with Babe's taciturn but loving farmer, a man behind the times who nonetheless is able to succeed because he recognizes the distinctive gifts of his animals, even when they want to do the work of the other, even, that is, when the pig, Babe, wants to do the work of a sheepdog. So here we see Freidenberg employs her knowledge of medieval history to analyze a film in popular culture. Even in academic contexts, analyzing medievalisms requires close reading, critical analysis, and creativity. And here she employs all of those things in order to open this popular film from the 90s to a new interpretation, a new set of ideas that challenges some of the social structures that seem to be revived by these medievalisms, by these calls to a simpler time from the past. Leslie Workman, one of the first voices in the academic field of studies of medievalisms, explains that medievalism is the study of scholarship which has created the Middle Ages we know, ideals and models derived from the Middle Ages and the relations between them. In terms of these things, medievalism could only begin not simply when the Middle Ages had ended, whenever that may have been, but when the Middle Ages were perceived to have been something in the past, something it was necessary to revive or desirable to imitate. So academics, just like artists, are engaged in reconstructing the Middle Ages through different mediums. 
you are encouraged to think critically and be transparent about the ways in which you're interpreting texts and including representations of medieval histories. So why is a video game set in the Middle Ages appealing to contemporary audiences? Why are we drawn to this world without instant access, technological advances, weapons of mass destruction, antibiotics, right? Uh, as we navigate this global pandemic, COVID-19, through yet another academic semester, what might we learn from accounts of the plague of the 14th century that claimed 50 million lives? That's 60% of Europe's medieval population. Norman Cantor argues that medieval civilization stands toward our postmodern culture as the conjunctive other, the intriguing shadow the marginally distinctive double, the secret sharer of our dreams and anxieties. This view means that the Middle Ages are much like our culture of today, but exhibit just enough variations to disturb us and force us to question some of our values and behavior patterns and to propose some alternatives, or at least modifications. Looking at the medieval past can help us to contextualize and understand our present moment. Think about our circumstances from a different angle. For example, in her article, B-Sides, Chaucer's The House of Fame, Sita Shiganti analyzes monuments and memory in a Middle English dream vision to discuss the removal of Confederate statues. I encourage you to ask, so what? Why is this relevant? What can we learn from this? And as you can see, Shiganti demonstrates how and why medieval literature intersects with our current social issues. Alternatively, we have Prince and Knight and Maiden and Princess. These are children's picture books, but they pack a powerful message. Are they astonishingly queer? No. Uh, Prince and Knight are still upper class, and there's some emphasis put on how handsome they are. Uh, nevertheless, most of us grow up with fairy tales set in this ambiguous medieval setting, right? once upon a time, long ago and far away. Uh, this is a literary convention, one that, by the way, even medieval writers were using. Convention establishes a tradition through repetition, and so most of us grow up with these dominant narratives of knights saving damsels from towers and dragons, right? So we're drowning in these popular stories that legitimize heter heteronormativity. Uh, men win women's love. And passive audiences who do not critically challenge the popular media that is foisted upon them accept these conventions as essential natural truths, right? Um, only men and women can form romantic relationships together. However, History and nature tell us a very different story. Gender and sexuality are culturally constructed. Um, male and female are actually very narrow identity categories that are specific to time and place. Um, gender and sexuality are actually separate spectrums. A children's fairy tale featuring two women falling in love disrupts these dominant narratives, particularly when this narrative is set in that conventional, conventional, ambiguous fairy tale medieval setting, right? It's giving a tradition to a whole new audience to participate in. So for those of us who are drowning in a society that sinks anyone who isn't straight, this is a little bit of a chance to breathe. These are the conversations we'll be having as we analyze the ways in which medievalisms intersect with modern notions of race, gender, and sexuality. In fact, you'll notice that one of your first reading assignments is to survey the following web pages. These scholarly resources disrupt dominant historical narratives that suggest the Western Middle Ages are all about the cultural achievements of white Christian men. Medieval history is far more diverse. Medieval studies as a field is far more inclusive. 
Pretending that it is anything else makes one complicit in systemic racism and other apparatuses of oppression. Now, Kim Moreland asks a compelling question that many of you were probably thinking about when you registered for this course. What is the relationship between modern America and the Middle Ages? Did the Middle Ages offer a mythic golden past to which America could link itself? Do the social and martial conventions of courtly love and chivalry offer a guide, or perhaps a reproach, to an America whose vaunted freedom renders it particularly vulnerable to abrupt changes, technological disruptions, and social upheavals? Where do we see American medievalisms, and how do they fit into American culture? Well, they appear in our entertainment, for sure. We can see them in television shows and movies, on social media, right? Um, we can also see them in architecture. So in the state of Indiana, for example, we have a Gothic revival uh, evidenced by the Basilica of the Sacred Heart at Notre Dame, constructed in 1882. Uh, I'm from Pittsburgh, where we have the Cathedral of Learning at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, it looks a lot like Hogwarts from Harry Potter. <laughs> uh, most of you are probably familiar with Disney World and Disneyland, right, which feature medieval castles. Each of these examples impose a medieval European history onto an American landscape, an American landscape that continues to marginalize and erase the histories of indigenous peoples. So we need to think about the ways in which these architectural medievalisms continue to fabricate this tenuous connection between America and Western medieval traditions and at whose expense. When we analyze medievalisms, we are essentially dissecting the text, whether it's a poem, a book, a comic book, a movie, or even architecture to identify the medieval sides and social structures and how they're being employed in a new social context. So some questions to ask yourself as you do this analytical work over the course of this semester. What modern ideas are being imposed upon the Middle Ages? How are the Middle Ages employed by the text to criticize later cultural constructions? And what do we gain by blending or contrasting the medieval and the modern? I would like to introduce you to some helpful vocabulary. Let's start with anachronism, the erroneous reference of an event, circumstance, or custom to a wrong date, anything done or existing out of date. This photo, for example, features someone in medieval costume using a modern cell phone, right? A cell phone would have no place in the Middle Ages. Next, we have authenticity, the quality of being true or in accordance with fact, veracity. How do we go about constructing historically accurate representations of the Middle Ages? What are the stumbling blocks to achieving authenticity? Is authenticity even possible? The definition of authenticity also includes the quality of being authoritative or duly authorized, an authority. What are the authoritative sources for the Middle Ages? Who are the cultural authorities then? Who do we look to now? How is authority constructed? And what does it mean for authority to be a social construct? Does this very constructedness undermine the authenticity of that authority? To complicate things, Richard Gleiser explains that medievalism is not about defining a particular truth about the Middle Ages, but rather about defining the truth of a Middle Ages, a point of impasse that is the subject of representation across periods, media, genres, and theories. Medievalism acknowledges the fictional structure of history, going beyond simple historical understandings to focus instead on a mythic structure that ties us to history. In this class, we're going to explore just that, this fictional structure of history, the ways in which we're tied to a mythical structure. Um, and I want you to think about the ways in which medievalisms challenge these notions of authenticity and authority. Um, how is authority constructed in both medieval and modern contexts? Uh, in fact, my dissertation is about queer constructions of medieval cultural authority. And then this informed my later publications, 
uh, on medievalisms, which looks at the ways in which some figures borrow signs and media from the Middle Ages in order to construct their own modern cultural authority. Cultural memory is the sense of history that is derived from dominant historical narratives and ideologies maintained by a group of people. For example, if I were to ask a general audience, who was the first king of England? Many of them will answer, King Arthur. This is not true. Popular culture has real significant influences on the ways that we think about the past, and this affects the ways we think about ourselves now. So who is authorized? What subjects, what identity categories are authorized by histories? If the most pre prevalent histories and historical representations are of straight white Christian men building societies, the cultural memory loses a significant portion of the population. The contributions and innovations made by marginalized people, women, people of color, Muslims, are obscured over time so that people buy into the cultural memory adopts these dominant repetitive narratives. Myth. A traditional story typically involving supernatural beings or forces. A widespread but untrue or erroneous story or belief. A person or thing held in awe or generally referred to with near reverential admiration on the basis of popularly repeated stories, whether these are real or fictitious. So, coming back to our definitions of authenticity, myths construct authority on the basis of repetition by imposing onto the cultural memory. But, by definition, a myth is not authentic. It's not true. Finally, neo-medievalisms. This is a subset of medievalisms that playfully and self-consciously deviate from historical accuracy. They're often comical, and you can expect to find many anachronisms here. Uh, we'll look specifically at Monty Python and the Holy Grail as one example of neo-medievalisms. Moving forward, we're going to read medieval texts and compare, compare these to modern medievalisms and analyze them both within their respective historical contexts. Along the way, you'll do a research project, a creative writing project where you play with medieval literary genres, and a final project that combines both research and creativity. Don't panic just yet. Later this semester, I'm going to provide three demonstrations of what this final project ought to look. This is going to include a close reading of poetic medievalisms, feminist approaches to Disney medievalisms, and then a discussion of race, justice, and medieval social structures. You have plenty of time to read and explore medievalisms uh, before developing your final project, but you might want to start shopping around now for medievalisms that inspire you. So to get you started, try looking through this lecture, this video, your syllabus. Uh, as we go through some of the medievalisms mentioned in your journal articles, you might want to explore these further. Um, additionally, just three blocks from Wabash College campus, you can find the public library, which features, if you go in the next week or so, uh, on the second floor, this central display of remixed classics. Now, I would caution you, just be sure if you choose from this display, you're actually selecting a medievalism, because there's also some retellings of Greek myths, as well as adaptations of Shakespeare. But you can see in this photo, the mere wife is a retelling of Beowulf, and Snow, Glass, and Apples is a short retelling of Snow White. But I caution you, this tale is not for the faint of heart. Uh, our local library also includes graphic novels, such as Fables, which reworks Arthurian legends and Arabian Nights. And in the DVD section, you'll find popular titles worth exploring. So, don't think of this as homework. Use this just to have fun, have a movie night, watch something with your friends, and just explore some of the medievalisms that you're probably already familiar with and coming into contact with on a daily basis. Get a library card. It's free. There are many benefits. Um, check out their resources. You can also see, if you look around, they include things like this pamphlet, which has a list of fantasy literature, 
Once again, just be sure if you look up any of these titles, you are actually drawing on a medievalism. Um, and if you have any questions, talk to the librarian. Of course, talk with me. Later this semester, we're going to meet with Ms. Norton, who is our humanities librarian, and she's going to talk us through how to use Lilly Library's databases so that you can find resources for your research and creative projects that will be relevant to this course. Take a look at some of these resources, which I'm providing here. You can jot some of these down. I will also make them available in Canvas along with other resources for you to check out at your leisure. With this final project, you have a lot of freedom. Do something that excites you. How does this class overlap with your personal and professional interests? Use this as an opportunity to explore unfamiliar cultures and experiences. Develop a project that you're going to be proud of, not simply something that's going to fulfill the requirements of the course. This is a literature class. Have fun. Finally, if you're watching this video as part of your assignment, please identify two medievalisms that have not been featured in this video, and then head on over to Canvas and take the short quiz. I'll see you all next time. Thank you.